Welcome back to Black News Tonight. Being a mother is a dream of many women. Many of them are unprepared to deal with possible fertility problems, but it's more common than many think. According to the CDC, one in eight couples or 12% of married women have trouble getting pregnant or sustaining a pregnancy. For black women, the battle can be even longer. Aside from dealing with the racist perception of being super fertile, frequent challenges can go from the cost of fertility services, the prejudice from physicians uh, that they see, to the feelings of isolation and shame that they have to deal with. Joining me now to discuss this and much more is Desia James Lewis. She's a Hollywood choreographer and she's the author of the book Game of Life, Releasing the Weight When God Says Wait. I love that title. Desia, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, in your book, you detailed your journey, your personal journey with infertility and the effect it had on your relationship. Uh, since this is a taboo topic for so many still, what made it, what motivated you to tell this story publicly? First off, thank you for having me and just allowing this platform to discuss uh, this taboo subject. For me, it came from uh, just a place of feeling alone and wondering if there was anybody out there that was feeling just the weight of, you know, all of the, the um, ailments or even the, the doctor's appointments. There were so many uh, things associated to this journey to trying to conceive that it became almost frustrating in a sense, but also you kind of guarded um, who and what you actually engaged in conversation with because you feel alone, to be honest, you feel completely alone in this journey. Racial stereotypes seem to play into this as well. Again, there's this idea that black women are super fertile. So there's a way that I think uh, it's probably harder for black women to come forward and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm having fertility issues or for doctors and other people in the medical establishment to believe that fertility is really an issue. Am, am I, am I, is that an accurate assessment? I, I believe that it is. It, it's quite accurate. I, I, there, there's also this societal uh, stigma, right? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby and a baby carriage. And I believe that that's just the perception that we have. You don't necessarily think that you're going to have issues conceiving, but I also think that there is a lack of knowledge that's been administered to us as black and brown women about our bodies. Uh, for me, um, particularly, I didn't think that there was going to be a concern and I didn't start to take those uh, precautions and those tests until I decided that we wanted to conceive. And I think that when you when you get into this place of finding out that there's PCOS and there's um, endometriosis and there's cysts that you can have, um, there's so, cervical cancers, there's so many things that is associated with infertility that we're just not aware of, nor do we talk about in our community, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I felt like nobody that that looked like me was talking about this whole process, just not even having the knowledge of how to proceed in this journey. We must have a conversation about it, especially as black and brown women. And, and as we're having that conversation, you give us some uh, rules of engagement. In the book, uh, you offer useful information about how to approach the sensitive conversation. Uh, what are some of the rules? So, there's several rules. I think that we have to start learning how to have conscious conversations because it's not as conventional as it was 60 years ago, right? Uh, we're getting married later. We're deciding to have children later. We are even staying with our parents later after college. So those common questions like, what are you gonna do next um, after graduation? Or when are you gonna have kids? These are all conversations that we have to be very uh, cautious about proceeding. And so some of the rules are like, get a clue, right? So if you ask me, uh, when are you having kids? Or if you have kids and I say, no, not yet, that might be a sign for you not to proceed and continue to ask certain types of questions. Um, there's but one people like, will loose keep going. That's the crazy part. People be like, why not? You need to hurry up. What you waiting on? What you did? What did? And you don't consider that you might actually be <laughs> right. causing trauma or harm to people. Absolutely, you can trigger. You know, you you might not even know that that person has had a miscarriage or could be actually healing from whatever mental state that miscarriage uh, or, or loss of a child could have put that person through. So I just think that we have to be 
cautious about it. And I think the other rule that I'll speak about tonight is just trying to relate. Sometimes when people are going through waiting seasons, whether it might not be the despondency of infertility, right? You might be waiting for a spouse, waiting for breakthrough, waiting, waiting for your uh, dream job. But just being mindful that sometimes we need a listening ear and not you trying to relate to the situation by giving your what I call a testimony Tuesday. I think also we just have to be, uh, you know, just <laughs> aware and read the room. Like, let's have um, a, a conscious conversation and then start saying, what well, should I proceed? Mm. Is this my time to listen? You know, I, really, it's about reading the room <laughs> in real life. Reading the room is important. Another thing that you lead us toward is faith. You know, how did faith help you uh, turn the table? How did it help you deal with uh, struggles with fertility? What did you do? Um, prayer. <laughs> I believe uh, prayer mm. and therapy. Um, but in, its, in, in association uh, with my faith, um, I think it's important that I speak from a place that uh, of hurting and feel disappointed, right? As a believer, sometimes there can be a sense of entitlement as you're out professing, you know, um, the Lord to other believers or non-believers. You can feel like God is a genie and he owes you something, right? And so as I was pressing in, you know, for just the dreams of, of my life, in my prayer time, I just started to see myself and really understand, okay, why is it feel, why do you feel like this is a, a God that owes you something? This is the God who has graced you and given you something, which is what we all have, which is life. And so I believe that faith plays a very significant part of our life. The, the Bible literally says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is what keeps us all hanging on. I know many people that are walking around right Right at the brim of agnosticism because there's a lack of hope there, right? And so I believe that in any journey, vision forward, whatever it is that you believe in, you have to see something and then you have to believe what it is that you saw and not only that, what it is that you've seen. And then from that place, you have to start the follow through. I think that there is this element of faith and then there's this element of action that we have to, you know, join together. I can't pray, 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 pray that this is going to happen for me and we're going to conceive, but then I don't find out the things that are going going on with my body. You know, there's a disconnect there, right? And so I think that it, it, we have to be intentional, not only about our faith, but how we proceed and the actions that follow our faith. Absolutely. Well, that's all in this amazing book. All right, make sure you purchase it. It is called The Game of Life, Releasing the Weight When God Says Wait. It's available at Barnes & Noble. It's available at bookshop.org. It's available at unclebobbies.com. And it's available at her website, They See a James dot com.